There we go. All right. Uh, during the Bible class last week, uh, we talked about forgiveness, and I was going to finish up that final thought in a sermon. Uh, and we talked about the concept of, you know, that if you want to be a real Christian, you need to know how to forgive other people. And in particular, what we want to talk about this morning is what happens when you decide to put forgiveness off. What happens when you, dis- when you what happens essentially when you decide to prolong forgiveness is what we're going to look at. And we're going to look at a number of different passages as you uh, can tell in the handout. So, first of all, I want to talk about for a moment the story of a lady named Ava Kaur. At 10 years old, Ava Kaur was taken from her home to Auschwitz-Birkenau, which was one of the more infamous one of the more infamous concentration camps, probably one of the most well-known. And obviously, she experienced for a little bit over a year before the Soviet army liberated the camp about one whole year later, uh, experienced all the horrors that we know occurred for those that had experienced the Holocaust, all the different types of affliction, starvation, things of that nature. There were a lot of people that survived. There were a lot of people that died in the Holocaust. She was one of the few that was actually able to survive. But Ava Kaur became more famous, or it became famous later in life because of her work talking about the Holocaust, and in particular, her work when it came to forgiving those that had been responsible for the Holocaust. She created an organization called Candles that helped expose the public to some of the things that the Nazi doctors would experiment with the patients on, which she was subject to as well. But she became very famous in 2006 when she made a very public apolo- or a public statement saying that she forgave or that she forgave all of those SS officers who had been in charge of the concentration camps. And in 2015, there was a case where uh, a man named Oscar Groening, who had formerly been an officer there at the same camp, went to trial basically to say that what had happened in the Holocaust was true because there were a lot of Holocaust deniers. And when, she, when he went and testified, uh, one of the more notable things that happened in that court, ca- or what happened in that trial, is that Miss Ava Kaur went up and hugged him, uh, a, an SS officer who had been at that same concentration camp that she had been at well over 70 years ago. Ava Kaur simply, when asked about this in, in numerous instances, talked about the need for her that she wanted to forgive others to help herself out. And that's an example of a lady that who experienced a lot of one of the worst things that humanity has ever witnessed and yet still had the courage to forgive someone that had in part been responsible for a lot of her affliction. But for a lot of people it's not so easy to forgive other people, especially in a situation like that. But what we want to consider this morning is what happens when we as Christians prolong forgiveness. What happens when we as Christians prolong forgiveness? Again, when we talk about prolong, we're talking about the idea of procrastinating or putting off. We can we maybe procrastinate in other aspects of life, but we want to think about what happens when we procrastinate, when we don't forgive others, or we try to put that off. Well, there are going to be a number of passages that we're going to look at all in regards to these three points. So first of all, what happens when we prolong forgiveness? Well, one, we lose potentially the opportunity to forgive. Now, what I will say is that there is no moratorium on when one can forgive another. The word moratorium just simply means a prohibition on something. Uh, In other words, there's a certain time frame in which you have to wait before you can do something. Uh, sometimes I have to tell my kids that at school, if they're about to take a test and they start asking me a bunch of questions about what's going to be on the test, I tell them there's a moratorium on those type of questions. I can't answer it because you're about to take the test. Uh, and so there is no moratorium. There is no prohibition on when one can forgive another. 
somebody does something wrong to you, you have the opportunity to forgive them pretty much immediately. You don't have to wait to do that. And as Christians, we shouldn't be the type of people that wait to forgive other people. We'll talk about some of the problems that can come from that as we move throughout our points this morning. But when you, when you think about how quickly we should be to forgive other people, I think about two examples in the New Testament. I think about Jesus and I think about Stephen. Look for a moment at Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. <coughs> At this point in time, Jesus has been arrested and he's basically in the process of having his clothes torn and being put on the cross to die. And so, as a result of this, most people in this situation would have been very upset with the soldiers doing this when the man who was being punished was, of course, innocent. But in Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 34... It says that Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Now keep in mind that Jesus at this point has lost basically everything, at least earthly at this point. His followers have forsaken him. His mother and, and really John are going to be the only ones that are there that you know, had, had been there with him at his crucifixion. Loses his clothes, loses a lot of earthly pride in what's being going, going on here. It's being put in the middle of of two criminals, and Jesus knows that he is about to die unjustly, and yet what does Jesus want those that are doing all of this affliction to him, what does he want them to know? Well, he makes a public statement that, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You see, Jesus didn't have to wait to forgive somebody. The example that Jesus left behind is we forgive as quickly as possible. Because otherwise, we could lose the opportunity. Now I want to look a little bit more specifically at the example of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. I know we've read through this in our Bible class on Wednesday nights in the book of Acts. But I want to think about the example of Stephen here. Because we're not talking about, you know, perfection, right? Stephen's an innocent, or Stephen's a human subject to faults just like we are. And yet when Stephen, who had been arrested for preaching the gospel and is about to be put to death essentially for blaspheming God according to the Jews that arrested him, it says that when they had heard these things, that the, that the chief priest and the leaders there, that they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their feet, or down their clothes, at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. But notice verse 60, Then he knelt down and cried, cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You think about in a similar situation, an innocent man is being put to death. A lot of people would have said some very hateful things towards the people responsible for doing that. They probably would have felt justified in doing that. And look at what Stephen says, the two things that he states, as they are basically in the process of what would commonly happen, break the man's legs and then stone him to death. He acknowledges two things. One, where he's heading, Lord Jesus received my spirit. But he also acknowledges what his attitude is towards those that were punishing him unjustly. You don't read anything about him cursing them or trying to talk about where they're headed based on what they're doing. All that Stephen wanted them to know when it came to his mindset towards them is, I forgive you. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. In other words, I forgive you for what you're doing to me right now. I don't think there are a whole lot of people that would have had the spiritual strength to be able to say that, that I forgive you for what you're doing to me. You think about later on when Saul, who was obviously there when that happened, when he became a Christian and he was sitting in prison on numerous occasions. You often think about how in the world did Paul have the spiritual strength to get through all of those different imprisonments in which, of course, he was imprisoned unjustly. 
I often wonder if Paul didn't think about the example of Stephen and how Stephen had the right mindset about how, what, is my, what is my willingness to forgive other people. Because we know, of course, Paul, a lot of times when he was in prison, used that as an opportunity to preach the gospel. Paul wouldn't have had that mindset if he didn't know how to forgive those that were responsible for putting him in prison. The Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. Why is it that Paul stayed there and taught him the gospel rather than to seek revenge? It's because Paul knew that he needed to quickly forgive just as Stephen had laid out that example for us. Because you see, Stephen was right there on the moment of death. Death was right around the corner. He knew that he wouldn't have another opportunity to express his forgiveness, but the last thing that he wanted those people to know is that he had forgiven them. Folks, when we get at odds with other people, we need to recognize that life is short, and while it may feel good sometimes to hold on to grudges, to be angry at people, we don't know when the last opportunity is that we're going to have to be able to publicly say, I forgive you. And the examples of Jesus and Stephen show us that if we prolong <clears throat> forgiving other people, we may lose the opportunity to do that. And as that connects to our other two points, put us in a very bad predicament. Another reason why we need to not procrastinate in forgiveness is because of deepened animosity. A lot of times this can lead to much more sinister actions. Of course, we're familiar with the story of Cain and Abel, right? Cain offered a sacrifice to God. God did not have respect for it. Abel offered a sacrifice to God. God did have respect for it. And we know, of course, that that led Cain to, becoming, to become very jealous in this situation. A moment in which he needed to seek forgiveness for what he had done, but in this case, he did not want to seek forgiveness. He wanted to put it off in order to fulfill a much more sinister action, which, of course, led to Cain slaughtering his brother Abel. And the end result of that is Cain is marked by God, and Cain's life would then be very difficult moving forward. It's a situation in a man who should have sought forgiveness, but decided it wasn't time to do that, and it only furthered his hatred towards his brother, leading him to do something even more desperate. You think about Daniel chapter 6. You think about how Daniel, who had risen up and was very powerful within the kingdom of Babylon, that there were a lot of people that became very jealous at Daniel. But they knew, of course, that they could get Daniel to slip up by getting Nebuchadnezzar, or by getting Darius, the king of Persia, to create a law that required everyone in the kingdom to worship him, something that they knew Daniel would not do. And they used that as an opportunity to get Daniel, to arrest him, to throw him in a lion's den. And all of that happened because these men could not accept that Daniel had risen to that prominent place within the kingdom of Persia. And so instead of looking at their jealousy and hatred and saying, you know what, we need to go and find forgiveness for this. We need to go and ask Daniel for forgiveness for our thoughts towards him. They, just said, they decided to say, we're going to let it sit even longer. That's what led them to carry out this action to get Daniel thrown in the lion's den. And ultimately, though, Daniel comes out on top as a result of it. But see, when you prolong seeking forgiveness, that can lead to a deeper sense of hatred for other people, as evidenced by the story of Daniel's in the, Daniel in the lion's den. This level of hatred can also carry on for generations. If you're not willing to seek out forgiveness towards another person, that hatred can continue on down through your children and grandchildren. Think about the reconstruction of the temple in Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. In that particular passage, we see a group of Samaritans that come that want to rebuild, help the Jews in Judea to rebuild the temple. And because of their wickedness, the, 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 the Jews... Uh, basically tell them, we're not going to allow these people that worship idolatry to help us rebuild the temple. So what does that mean? That means that for 500 years, you have an animosity that develops between the Jews and the Samaritans all because of this one event 
So much so that when you look at Luke chapter 9, this animosity was so powerful that it even carried down to the apostles of Jesus. In Luke chapter 9, we read about Jesus visiting a village of the Samaritans. It says that it came to pass when the time had come for Jesus to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. In verse 53, all that means is that is a reference to the 500 years of animosity that began between the Jews and the Samaritans because of what happened in Ezra chapter 4. Neither side sought forgiveness. or not, Neither side wanted to reconcile the problem, and that led to 500 years of hating one another. So much so that in verse 54, the apostles of Jesus, one of whom in Acts chapter 8, the apostle John would wind up preaching to these same people, where he says in verse 54 that James and John saw this and they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? A hatred that was so powerful that the apostles of Jesus had basically resorted and said, Jesus, the only alternative is just to kill these people. That's how worthless they are because they don't receive you. Folks, that's what happens when you, for, when you fail to forgive quickly. It leads to animosity, hatred, developing and existing for a long period of time. But as Jesus said in verse 55, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are for the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And that's why, of course, the example of Jesus and the concept of forgiveness, Acts chapter eight, John has a completely different attitude with no complaints when he goes to preach to the same people that he once thought deserved to die. What does that point to? It points to the fact that hatred or disdain cannot exist when trying to love God. Jesus laid that point down very clear in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus taught to his followers about not having hatred in your heart because that's where murder begins. Instead, he said in verse 22 of Matthew chapter 5, But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift." And Jesus is pointing out here, much like those people that he preached to probably had conflict with either the Gentiles or the Samaritans, he pointed out, you cannot claim that you love God and be, or at least have a hateful attitude towards another person. That's why he says, go and reconcile that problem with your brother, and then come and offer your gift, because then it will be acceptable to God. And as Brother Wayne read for us in the Bible or in the scripture reading at the beginning of the sermon, 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, John says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he does not, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So why is it a terrible idea to prolong forgiveness because it leads to deepened animosity. That animosity, as clearly stated in Matthew chapter 5 and 1 John chapter 4, will keep us from being faithful to God. We cannot be pleasing to God and have hatred in our heart for our fellow man because of deepened animosity. And then the final point, it's detrimental for both parties. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 points out that Christians should not want to be at odds with one another. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul is dealing with a situation in which there is a man, maybe it connects to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the same man that had taken his father's wife and was living in adultery. could also pertain to somebody who had 
tried to destroy Paul's reputation as what happened frequently in 2 Corinthians, the letter, the second letter to the church in Corinth. Whatever the case may be, there was a problem between Paul and the church with one specific brother in the church. But Paul says in verse 5, If anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent not to be too severe. This punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. So we have here a clear case of a man that has done something wrong, that has essentially acknowledged he has done wrong, and he is trying to seek for forgiveness. And so Paul says in verse 8, Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. And Paul's telling them here, this man seeks forgiveness. He's done. He's, he seeks for forgiveness. He is trying to make things right. Your responsibility is here is to reaffirm your love to him. Forgive him. I also forgive him. For whatever reason it may be, if he has genuinely shown repentance, if he seeks forgiveness, you forgive him because I also forgive him is what the Apostle Paul is saying. But the real problem comes in verse 11. What happens if you don't forgive this man? Because you shouldn't want to be at odds with one another. Paul said that this was a very difficult thing to write about in verse 3. Paul did not want to be at odds with this one specific brother. But if you don't forgive, it's detrimental for both parties because it gives an opportunity for Satan to work. It gives an opportunity for Satan to work. That's why verse 11, it states, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, a lot of times that verse is used in sermons, but a lot of times it's not connected to the, to the actual context in which it's written. But you, but you think about the significance of that verse in this context. What is Paul saying here? Think about it. You've got one man that has sinned that, the, that, sa that Satan has essentially captured, right? He's away from the church, he's lost, but now he seeks for, seeks for forgiveness. However, if the church does not forgive him, this is a great opportunity for Satan. Because not only would he only have this one man who, maybe because of his own sorrow, feels like he cannot come back and be a part of the church anymore, not only would Satan gain that individual, he would also gain the entire congregation because failing to forgive somebody is just as much of a sin as whatever this man had done. And Satan could have used that as an opportunity to take that whole congregation spiritually as hostage to where they fall away from God because of a congregation that said, we're not ready to forgive you. So why is it important to not put off forgiveness? Well, because we don't want to give an opportunity for Satan to not only capture the one who seeks forgiveness, but, for, but also to capture the people that are unwilling to forgive him. And that's something that we cannot put off doing. So what's the concluding point? I like this quote that I came across. And it simply said that the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. I think about that, the example there at the very beginning of the lesson with Ava Kaur. Uh, Ava Kaur was a young girl when all that happened. Again, you think about in that situation, uh, you know, a lot of times a person wouldn't point to an older lady who was in her 90s in 2015 and say that's a very strong person because she's an older lady and very fragile and feeble. But she was a very strong lady because she knew the importance of, for, of forgiveness. And that goes back to this point that the weak can never forgive. Spiritually speaking, that's true as well. The spiritually weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the spiritually strong. It's something that we have to work at. And if we want to be the type of Christians that God expects us, we have to be spiritually strong and be willing to forgive others as soon as we can. This morning, of course, if we, uh, if we have not obeyed the gospel, that's something else that we also don't want to delay.
And the Bible is very clear that we have to hear the Word of God. We believe in Jesus. We repent of our sins. We confess Christ. And we are willing to be baptized to have those sins forgiven. And then, of course, if we do stumble away from God, we can have prayer made for the forgiveness of those sins and have the encouragement of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who are also willing to acknowledge that they have forgiven us. This morning, if you have any need, won't you come while we stand and while we sing? I am resolved, no.